Tuesday, October 9th, school board, 2007 school board meeting. Would you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Alan, you have some adjustments to the agenda? Yes, I do. Uh, I'm making a few adjustments because we always talk about having people come in to speak to us, and then if they're late on the agenda, it takes forever for them to speak. So uh, Kathy and I were talking earlier, and I'm going to make a couple of changes so they can go early. Uh, the first one will be, if you look under number 8B, report on Let's Go, and Karen Burke will be introducing that. I'm going to move that up. And uh, end of communications is the first communications piece, so it becomes A. The second one that I'm going to move and will become B is under recognition, number seven, recognition. Terry White, I'm going to move that up to B, and then we'll move each of those that are under communications down to C, D, E, and F, if you don't mind. Uh, I also have two pieces of information that came in to me today. I brought them both. The first one is the resignation of a health aid person at Pond Cove, and that will become 10E. And that document is on your table. I passed it to you tonight. It came in this morning. And 10F is going to be field trip information uh, from uh, Gretchen McNulty. And Jeff is going, to is going to talk about that tonight, and that's under 10F. So those were new additions to it. I will also mention to you on your, on your table, I've also given you pages 64 and 65, I think it is, out of the booklet on consolidation uh, because when I passed out the original set, those pages were not in it and I uh, discovered it was not in my packet. Uh, Pauline found it in her packet, so we did bring those today uh, so that you would have a complete packet on the consolidation. Those are the changes that I have at this point in time. Thank you, Alan. Uh, approval of the September school board minutes. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you, Linda. Is there a second? Trish, uh, discussion, zeros, emissions. Can I just make note that you have at the end of these minutes, you have some school board policies that were policies you passed last month, and they're put on here. Uh, Mary put them here so that you can put them with your policy book so you'll have them. So you have uh, DID, JJI, uh, bear with me. Uh, you have the JJIR and KFR and KF are all there. So those are just there so that they can go into your policy manuals. Okay. Any uh, other any other changes or errors omissions to the minutes? No? Seeing none, all in favor? Closed? Uh, six zero. I had to think that through, Mary. Okay, four, um, comments by student reps. Do we have middle school student reps yet? Okay. We don't. Okay. Um, Kirsten, it looks like maybe it's falling to you for the high school piece. Would you like to make any comments? or? Um, we were asked to talk to um, students about the seven point, ten point grading system. I did a rough survey of talking to a minimal amount of people, and most people seemed to agree with the seven point system because they like the higher standards and uh, the way it looks on our college applications. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Important baseline. Super. Great. Welcome, Hudson. Thank you. As, as you come flying in, is there anything you want to add to that? Yes. No. Would you like to add anything? We just got to the part where you folks were commenting, and I didn't know if there was anything you'd like to say or if you want to catch your breath and say something in a few minutes, if you'd rather. No, it's fine. Um, the only thing that we had really been talking to students about because we were asked who was in regards to the seven point and 10 point grading scale, and the greater majority of students uh, surprisingly said that they would like the seven point grading scale more because uh, the way it affects college applications. <laughs> Great. At least you reported okay. the same thing. Yeah. So it didn't change. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, thank you very much for taking on that project. We really appreciate that because it was a piece that we didn't have. We had yeah. talked to with some parents and we'd heard from some other folks and um, we didn't have the student uh, piece about that, so it was good to have that. Great. Um, comments from public on non-agenda items. Is there anyone from the public 
to comment on non-agenda items. No, seeing none, we'll move on to communication. Um, let's see, 6A is now our report on Let's Go. Uh, Karen, did you want to do the introductions? I was, on behalf of the Cape Elizabeth Wellness Committee, I'd like to welcome Tori Rogers, who's in the audience, and will be getting up and doing a presentation soon, and Allison Landis, who's also sitting behind her. Um, Tori is the director of the Kids Co-op at the Barbara Bush Children's Hospital at Maine Medical Center and the physician advisor to Let's Go. Allison is a pediatrician, Cape resident, and parent of a Cape Elizabeth fifth grader. Uh, Let's Go is a five-year community initiative designed to engage the communities of greater Portland to work on increasing healthy eating and physical activity for children and their families. It was started by seven founding partners, Anthem, Unum, TD Bank North, Hannaford, Maine Medical Center, Maine Health, and United Way. Members of the Wellness Committee have had several enthusiastic and detailed conversations with Tori and the wonderful members of the Let's Go staff um, to determine how we can make forward progress with our wellness initiative in Cape Elizabeth. So tonight, Tori will give an overview um, and presentation of how Cape Elizabeth and Let's Go will be working together to improve nutrition and wellness awareness in our community. So please um, welcome Tori and Allison. I know you have another introduction that you will make. Thank you very much. I should mention while Tori's getting set up, she actually figured out how to make this projector work and to get everything set up and going. So we also will have her here as a technology person to do these things. That's my day job, right? Um, let me just get this up here. Um, well, thank you very much, um, Madam Chairperson of the School Board. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity to come and talk to you about something that I'm very passionate about, which is um, health and wellness and this project called Let's Go. What I'd like to do, um, Emily Bugby, who also works um, with me, um, she's at, from Anthem on the Let's Go project and lives in Cape, is passing out a handout. Um, I'm going to hopefully talk for about 10 minutes, and then I really wanted just to open it up for any comments, um, concerns, or questions that you all have. So as Karen said, Let's Go is a community-based initiative, which is great for me because I often am in the hospital and in, and in doctor's offices. So for us, it's very exciting to think about being out in the community. Um, and it's really to promote healthy lifestyle choices for children, youth, and families in the 12 greater Portland communities. And our goal is to increase physical activity and healthy eating for children and youth age 0 to 18. So I haven't said that O word, the obesity word yet, but I'm sure some of you may be thinking about it. Because this really project isn't about childhood obesity, but it really was the call to action to get the seven founding partners that are uh, listed here to think about what they could do. So childhood obesity is the call to action. That's why we really um, got together. But it's not going to be the strategies that we're using to engage the communities. The strategies are 5210. And you have that little handout. It's a little red dude. That's our mascot for Let's Go. And the 5210 is a mnemonic that we've been using um, in the healthcare setting for about three years here in Maine. I do work in Maine, and I also do work nationally. We've used this mnemonic in a, a number of other settings, mostly in the healthcare and community. In Massachusetts and Delaware, um, Washington State. And the five stands for eating five fruits and vegetables on most days. I know it's hard for most of us to do that. Two is limiting screen time, non-educational screen time, to two hours or less. And one is one hour of physical activity a day. And the zero really is um, trying to avoid sugary sweetened beverages and really encourage water and low-fat milk. The power of this mnemonic is really quite surprising to me because it crosses literacy lines, it crosses cultural lines. And also, as many of the docs that I work with said, you know, I never could really talk about this nutrition healthy kind of stuff because we don't really get a lot of nutrition training in medical school. But they could talk about these things. And we started thinking, this is really quite a powerful mnemonic that was used in the doctor's offices. We started to think about ways it could be used in different settings. So for Let's Go, our strategies that we're doing and working in the community is based upon 5210 and some other things. And we can talk about that. I put this up because this is my, actually my favorite slide, is I'm here talking to a school board, but I've had the opportunity to talk to community events and to doctors and to policymakers. Um, and it's really a shared responsibility we have around healthy behaviors. The school board and the schools shouldn't feel that they need to take on more than they're already doing. The role of schools is to educate our kids, and they do it great. But I think if we can fit this puzzle together and we do it in a way that makes sense, we're going to be having some really lasting impacts. 
So Let's Go is going to be working in all four of these areas and in all four of these places that I mentioned here. The key is consistent messaging. How many of you have heard about physical activity and healthy eating? I, I've heard it a gazillion and four times. But it's always a little different. And the little difference is very confusing for patients, families, doctors, nurses, teachers, everybody. So we really feel with Let's Go, consistent messaging is the key. We're going to be doing work in all four of these areas, but since I'm here at the school board, I'll talk to you about our work in schools. So here in the education sector, we really have a continuum. Um, we really are we're working with preschools, we're working with childcare settings, all the way up to adult ed, which has been fascinating. We've had some, some of the work that I did in York County last year, we had some of the adult ed folks come to us and say, hey, can you, we do this 5210 thing? I said, sure. And so we think, you know, grandparents are doing a lot with the kids, so maybe we could do that thing. And I loved it, because I wasn't quite sure what they meant about the thing, but it was an opportunity for me. For the education sector, for the schools, we're going to be using this project called 520 Goes to School. I would mentioned that we'd use this mnemonic in a lot of different places. Well, last year I really got thinking about, well, if it works so well in a healthcare setting, what does it look like in schools? So we did a pilot project in nine schools. I, I just really wanted to do it at my daughter's school in Saco, but you can't just do it in one, and it sort of went from one to nine. And it was great. We had some really amazing stories, and I can share more of that with you. But we're going to use what we learned from that in this program called 520 Goes to School. It's a phased approach. It's totally voluntary. It's all about working with interested schools or school districts, taking them where they are to where they want to go. It's going to be over the next three or four years. People can come in and out of this. It's not a, a, stri a strict research model. And we're just beginning our work in child care and after school programs. So what is this 520 Goes to School? It's a program to increase healthy eating and physical activity. Okay? It's nothing about the O word here. It's really just about these behaviors. It's not a curriculum. People keep saying, so what's the curriculum? How do I teach it? It's not a curriculum. We have developed lesson plans because teachers asked us to do it. But the essence of 520 can be embedded in any curricula that you want. There are 10 strategies that are all evidence-based that we think schools could use. And we have connections to local, state, and national resources. So the strategies you may ask. Well, it's not rocket science, so don't get overwhelmed by this, but it's things like encouraging healthy snacks brought in from home and available at school-related events. I mean, it's just some basic stuff. We've developed tools and resources, which again, I'll tell you more about for each of these. Another strategy, school meals should provide healthy choices, discouraging the use of food as a reward. This is my pet, because this happens everywhere. The use of electronics that support physical activity. We had some really wonderful work that is done using something called Dance Dance Revolution, which are gaming mats. And we've had kids really get up and moving a lot in the school system, in, in the classroom actually, and using that as a reward. The school is participating in National TV Turnoff Week or something similar to that. The six strategies incorporating physical activity into the school day, and we have again resources for that using physical activity as a reward. And when you talk to kids and you ask them what they want when they do the best fundraising ever, it's not a pizza party. You know what it is? Extra recess. Participate annually in one or more school-wide events that promote physical activity. And the ninth strategy is encouraging water, low-fat milk instead of sugar-sweetened drinks. And the tenth, the most important, well, not the most important, one of them is being a role model. So those are the strategies, and again, I've said it's not a curriculum, and it's really not about teachers, so everybody always thinks these things are about teachers. This is a briefcase that we put together, and these are the four components, and I think it's very important if we're going to be effective in schools, um, it's not for me to tell a teacher how to teach nutrition. However, if he or she wants to know about 520 and how can they incorporate it, we're here to help. It's not for me to tell a physical education teacher on how to get their kids up and moving. But if they want some help, we've got some resources and some ways to do that. I'm not going to go through each of these, but I put this up because this shared responsibility is key. I have a job and a role as a parent to make sure what I bring in for celebrations is um, healthy for my kids. I have a role as a parent when I chaperone school events that I'm not bringing in a ton of Gatorade and a ton of, you know, Snickers bars this big. And I have a role as a parent to help and work with school boards as I'm doing in my own town. I think teachers have a role to play, but I, I actually think that the role that they play, it, it, it's critical to it. 
but all these other pieces around them can help them do their job more effectively. So 520 Goes to School is all of these, and I think that that's what's important. We have a toolkit that we've developed with the help of parents and educators um, and um, folks from the state and nationally, and we just talk to people, what would you need to implement these strategies? So we have specific strategies, we have resources, we have flip charts, we have lesson plans, and we have parent handouts that go home, again, that consistent messaging that we're also using in doctor's offices, like Dr. Landis's office. So how are we going to do this? Well, again, this is voluntary. So we're not making anybody do anything. But if a school is interested, as CAPE has been interested, and we've had some really great conversations, we think it's important that they have a team that includes a representation of these kinds of folks. In the fall, what we'd like schools to do is to do a pre-phase evaluation to look at the environment, to see what is going on in their school. We have a survey, if the school would like to, for fourth and fifth graders around behaviors of 5210. We would be um, very interested in looking at wellness policies and the implementation to those. Some schools we work with right now are already doing BMIs and fitness grams, which is a level of physical activity. If schools want to do that, we're happy to help them, though this is not about measuring kids in schools, nor reporting back on that. In the spring, what we're going to do is the same thing to see how we've made progress. So what happens between the fall and spring is critical, though. What we're going to be doing, and we've already started doing this in 15 other schools in the greater Portland area, is work with the schools on what their goals are. So if their goals are on healthy snacks, then we'll be happy to have worked with them on that. We'll probably let them know a little more about some of the other strategies, but we won't be forcing that. And you can see some of the things that we're going to be doing, providing the toolkits. We have many grants up to $2,500 for each school to be working in this area. We're happy to do presentations, workshops for schools that are available technical assistance, and ongoing with this is we've hired a full-time um, administrative support person, Heidi Kessler, to work with the schools on this. We also have, since I see a, a couple of um, youth here, we have a youth advisory panel and we're very interested in getting feedback. We have about, Emily runs that, we have about 10 or 12 youth, and you know, we think we have a great idea, right? And the youth will go, that just stinks. So we really need to hear it back from the youth, so I will, any, any youth is happy to um, sit on our advisory panel. And then in the fall, we're going to do phase two. So what's been really fun for me is places like Cape Elizabeth, who have been very interested and have a very engaged uh, wellness committee, which says a lot, because some communities' wellness committees haven't been um, as vibrant. You know, after the policy was done, some committees um, weren't as vibrant as yours. Um, and we really understand your concerns and we really want to work with you. I think when I met with Rebecca and Karen the first time was we listened a lot. You know, what do you guys want? I mean, your community is different than other communities and we're very willing to, again, take you where you are to where you want to go. This kills the researchers, friends of mine, because they can't stand this kind of stuff, you know, the mushy things. They're like, can't you make the schools all do this? And we said, no, we're not making the schools do it. And especially if the school is already doing a lot of wonderful things, which you guys really are then we're just going to take you where you want to go. When I met with the superintendent, we talked about some of the things that you guys are doing, and, and I think oftentimes schools don't get a chance to really toot their horn. You guys have done an awful lot around wellness. There's a, the Student Nutrition Club in the fourth grade class, or the fourth grade. The, the guideline changes eliminating party food and birthday foods. Boy, there's a, there's a lot of things that other schools could really look toward you for. Working with the food service to eliminate the fried foods and decreasing sugar offerings and adding more whole grains. Really great work. And one of the things with Let's Go is we want to have you guys talk to other schools. How did you do that? Because these aren't easy things. And then middle school, some of these things, no slushies or donuts or cinnamon buns in the cafe. I mean, those are all yummy things, but we call them um, occasional foods, not everyday foods. Drinks and snack that contains less sugar and lower in fat. And I love this. Cookies are no longer the size of cow chips. <laughs> Um, in a dance and uh, an events, there's no more selling candy, and bottled water is really encouraged. And then in high school, there's also the elimination of soda in the vending machines. And physical activity um, uh, has been worked into professional development days. This is really big. I mean, there's a whole other piece to this about actually staff wellness. And I also think in your community, the Green Belt Trail system that Karen was telling me about is, is great. I mean, we all need to get up and be moving more and the Wellness Committee dedicated to working with a school nutrition program to offer healthier choices for children. Real successes that, that CAPE has had. In fact, when you said all this, I thought, well, what are we going to do? Because <laughs> you guys are already doing an awful lot. 
But what we've heard you guys are interested in, because we do listen, is working with the nutrition program to increase healthy options. Let's Go has pulled together all the 12, um, they represent the school nutrition directors from the 12 communities together, and we're working with the, the canteen and Cisco, the vendors, to really uh, see how we can work on the nutrition program. Um, also, I, we've heard you're, you're interested in exploring the rest of the toolkit to see what maybe some of the other strategies you want to work on, and maybe having some workshops and presentations, and also beginning the evaluation phase. As the superintendent said to me, you guys like evaluation, so I, I like that too. And really our goal is to take you where you are and, and defining that to where you want to go, which may be a different place than Portland or Falmouth. And I think we really uh, look at both of you guys. We really want to engage you guys in this. Um, you guys are the voice, and you guys really can make things happen. Um, so thank you very much for your time, and I'm happy to take any uh, questions or comments. Thank you very much, Tori. Sure. Questions? Comments? I just wanted to comment that one of the reasons why I was excited to have, and we were excited to have you come, is because not only do all the school board members get to a better feel of what we've been talking to you about, but the administrators are here, and when they talk about workshops and everything else in that school team, you're going to be a big part of this. So hopefully you um, were able to get a good idea as to what's going on, and please, if you have any questions, by all means, let us know. Ask Tori now or later, um, and we're very excited to be working with them. And around the workshops, because sometimes that's scary, I mean, for the administrators there, you guys, I'm sure, have things pretty much set. What we've, um, one of the things that worked, has worked very well is some staff presentations to go for 40 or, five, 40 or 45 minutes and somebody say, so Tori, how did they do that snack policy? And so here's what they did at Fairfield, or here's what they did at Old Orchard. And that's what I think has been very helpful. Also, we're happy, we have about 10 or 15 folks that we worked with last year and we're working with this year, we're happy to come, so teachers talking to teachers which I think, I'm not a teacher, so this is a little bit out of my comfort zone, though I'm getting better at it. Um, so we're happy to really share those kind of stories. The other thing I'm, I want to leave you with is that some people think this whole issue of getting our kids healthier is so complex. They have such an obesogenic environment and all these things are hitting them and that it's going to take something really big to make a difference. Well, the data that's coming out every day, two studies were published yesterday, that these small changes we make, 100 kilocalories or 100 calories difference, that's a half of a soda these days, not even a whole soda, really can take a kid from keeping them healthy if they don't drink that half a soda, keeping them healthy from going up to, to being not so healthy. Decreasing the amount of TV time they want, not to go to nothing. Tech is their world. We need to embrace it. So I think these small changes are important, so don't feel we have to take it all on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. All right, next one is um, Terry White. And Alan asked me to read an email that he received from Tom Lazar. It says, Terry White is too humble to brag on this, but one of his jazz band arrangements, written for our Wednesday evening jazz ensemble, has been accepted for publication by the Alfred Publishing Company, one of the world's largest music publishers. Thought you'd like to know, Tom. So with that, we'll ask Terry to come up and tell us about that. Yes, please. We always invite the published authors. <laughs> well, thank you very much for the, the recognition. Um, Tom is a great front man and PR man for me because he wasn't supposed to say anything. But for years, I've been doing a lot of writing for Tom even before he came to Cape. And he's always encouraged me, send that out to get published. Well. That's great, but you have to get recordings, and it's, it's very tedious, and then my stack of rejection letters far outweighs my stack of acceptance letters. And after a while, some of them are beautifully written. They're really great. Thanks, but it's not what we're looking for at this time. So I asked a guy one time, I said, what is it you're looking for? He said, something that'll sell a thousand copies. Didn't matter what it was. So years ago, I had a, a well-known composer who I'd worked with said, gee, my husband's got a big company. You should write for him. I'm going to encourage it. So I sent it, and he rejected it and sent it back. A couple of years later, they got divorced. I hope it wasn't over that. Um, <laughs> so I just kind of stayed with it. And the things that we do write for the Cape Jazz Band, Tom feels strongly is right into what most schools would, would really like to play. And in fact, usually after he gets done playing with them, 
uh, at the festivals, I get a lot of requests for, hey, can you send me a copy of that? Can you send me a copy? And I said, sure, right after Cape's done, whether you can have it next year. Um, so we, we hung with it. And uh, in fact, reality didn't sit in until a couple of months ago. I came home from school, and on the front stairs was a package from UPS or somebody, and it was the proofs of the first piece. Like, okay, this is really going to happen now. This is, this is real. It's just like when I buy it, it looks the same thing. My name's there and all that stuff. And today, the contract came that it get to sign. You have to be a lawyer to understand it. It's just, okay, where do I sign? I'm not sure what I'm signing, but it looks good, and these guys are big. So that's pretty much the extent of it. But a lot of it really does, the, the credit goes to Tom, because there's times when you just really say, ah, this is just too much work. It's not worth it. And a lot of it has to do with my wife, because when we first got married, this was pre-music on computer days. So at night, we'd be sitting there watching TV, and everything was done by hand. And that was tedious. I have an attic full of hand-copied music, because that's how I put myself through college. And uh, she referred to it as doing dots. That was the nighttime we'd watch TV and have our conversation. I'd have my artist boy, and I'd just be sitting there you know, doing all the legwork and so forth. So the computer has really, really helped that. But she's, she's dealt with my getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning to do my writing, because it's too early to mow the lawn or something. I'm just an early morning person. But she, she says, what do you do at 4 in the morning? I said, I write I'm on the computer. I get the headphones and all that. So um, it's, you know, I would be really, really pleased if it sold one-tenth what Harry Potter sells. That would be really nice. <laughs> But somehow I don't think it's going to fall into that vein. So that's pretty much been the process, and hopefully it will lead to some other things. And Tom usually comes around in May, and he says, Geez, I got this idea for a tune that we ought to do next year. And by July, we're now doing five tunes, and he's got something else planned. So the summer gets pretty well booked, thanks to Tom. So, so, so he's my, my PR and cheerleader. So that's pretty much it. Well, congratulations, Terry. Thank you. It's quite an honor. Yeah, it's, it's exciting. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Terry. You. Congratulations. Uh, update on the math lab at Pond Cove. Yes, I have placed in your folder uh, this newsletter uh, from the math lab. Uh, if you remember last spring, uh, Tom received a grant from CEF to set up a math lab to work specifically with children in K through 2 to ensure that the, the level of math that they have is met and so that by the time they end grade two, they will have those things in place. Deb Butterworth has worked diligently to get this going. Uh, she spent some time this summer both in uh, New Jersey and at Colby College getting training. I had the, uh, had the opportunity to visit her classroom uh, two weeks ago. Uh, it's an amazing classroom, very well planned, very well set up, uh, assessing what students are doing, et cetera. Uh, by November, or uh, maybe uh, December, she will be in to talk with you about it and show you the results of what she's doing. But the money that C put, put up for this is being very well spent, and it is truly trying to answer the needs of our young people. And so I just wanted to be sure you knew about it. Debbie is going to be doing this newsletter uh, on a regular basis just to keep people informed. And I noticed uh, Tom had an excellent article a few weeks ago in his newsletter about this as well. So I'm very pleased with it, and I said to Deb, tonight I just want to say a few words about it, and then we'll do a much more in-depth look at it after she's had a couple of three months of working with it and working with the parents. But uh, she'd be very proud of the work she's doing for the school system. Thank you, Alan. Uh, update on consolidation? Well, yes. Today, I received a letter from the commissioner, and it is the letter accepting our proposal to be a, an efficient, high-performing district. Uh, each of you has that proposal on your table, and I also have some down back for any of you who are in the audience and would like to take a look at it. Basically, what the, super, uh, what the commissioner talked about was that we had met both the 4% per pupil expenditure requirement for system administration. Uh, by the calculation she had, we were at 3.10%, and had also looked at our spending and saw that we remained in the correct guidelines. You will seek attached to this are copies of the initial proposal, uh, copies of the proposal with the dates and all everything checked off. My understanding with talking with the commissioner's office on Thursday is that now that this has been accepted, originally it looked like it was going to be a year-to-year -year inspection. 
It looks like now it's going to be every th uh, third year inspection. You also have in front of you, in this packet, you have the results of the review of the 2005-2006 budget. Um, I would say publicly, when I talked with um, Jim Ryer last week about this, uh, checking to see where we were and what was happening, uh, his statement to me was very clearly, your system provided the very best information that we got from any system in the state. And I said very quickly, that is thank you to Pauline Aportria who worked very hard in putting this 60 page report together. He actually began to say, and let's talk about, and I said, no, we're not talking about anything. Pauline did it, she's in Cape Elizabeth and that's where she's going to stay. But I think it's really important for you to know that uh, Cape Elizabeth was recognized as having provided the most comprehensive data of any school system in the state and that really pleased me. Uh, it also pleases me. I, as many of you know who have talked to me during the last few weeks, I have been sweating bullets about what's going to happen with this and figuring it would happen this way but not sure. And so I am very pleased we got the signed copy today. As a result of this and even before this came, I have started the December 1st report. Uh, I have got that outlined and I, as I said to you the last time when we have our workshop on October 23rd, I'll be bringing the initial pieces to that re of that report to you to take a look at and help me as we begin to add more things to it. But I had to, first of all, look at what needed to be done. I would also tell you that on Friday, I met with the superintendents of five of the six districts who were uh, high-performing schools, and I met with them and had a long discussion with them about these next steps, including budget, writing the December 1st report, et cetera, so that we were all approximately on the same wavelength as we do that. So we have been accepted. The report has started. I'll be bringing the report to you on the 25th of the initial pieces of the report so you can look at it and then begin to work with me to add things to that report as we move along. I will tell you, my intent is that report will be very long because what I intend to do in the report is both to show what CAPE is actually doing now that makes us an outstanding school system and what we will be doing in the future. Uh, for instance, I contacted Jeff the other day and he went to his guidance people and they have been able to give to me a list, not, just, not with the names of students, but a list of males and females in the classes of 03, 04, 05, 06, and 06, uh, and, to, and 07, as far as where they've gone to school, the students who did not pass, the students who uh, have gone to military, et cetera. So we have a very clear picture of a system where well over 90% of our students go on to further education. And that's a very important part of our report because we often, as school systems, get criticized for not doing enough to get our students uh, taking the next levels of education that they need to have. So there are many pieces to that puzzle that I will be working on. And so I have got a good start on it. And as I said, we'll be sharing it with you on October 23rd. Rebecca? Um, Alan, I just want to confirm that I heard correctly from you that in a conversation with Jim, Jim Breyer, he said three years, but we do not have that on paper. Not yet, but I have a meeting with him next week, and I intend at that point to say that we do need to have that as, as a final proof. And this coming legislative session, they, the commissioner is expected to look at the exemption benchmarks and offer any changes. Yes. So we should probably still keep an eye on that. Without any question, okay. without any question. I will, the report that I am writing when it is finished for December 1st, obviously it's meant for the, for the Department of Education. It will also obviously go to our legislator and also go to Connie Goldman, who is now serving on the State Board of Education, so that she has very clear information about what is happening here. And Connie and I have already talked briefly twice, and when she gets back from California, she will be meeting with me along with the other high-performing school districts to talk about where we are and what we're doing Great. to manage that. Thank you, Alan. Other questions, comments? No? Okay. Alan, monthly workshops? Uh, briefly, what I would mention is, is that you know the fourth Tuesday of each month is a workshop time. As you know, budget season is earlier than usual, that the administrators have to have their budgets to meet by December 14th. Uh, we need to talk about the monthly workshops uh, I know that some of you want to have presentations far above and beyond budget, and I understand that. 
but I also have some really tight schedules in order to get budgets done. My intent for the uh, October 23rd workshop is to continue to work on the consolidation piece and also have some discussions around budget, which includes, you remember, the green sheet, which is what we want for our schools, and each administrator is working on those, and they will be turning those into me soon so we can give you a printout of what they're looking at, and you are doing the same type of thing. And so my hope is, is that we can use the 23rd to take the next step in solidifying where we are going with budget where we are going with consolidation so that we will have our, our information well put together. Uh, the administrators, I met with the, the principals today and Dom and we talked about again what needs to be in this uh, budget and the open door that you have given them to really put down anything that they feel is absolutely necessary to manage the schools in the very best way possible. So that's what I'm looking at for October. However, the other piece that I'm looking at is I know that we did a summary report with you in September, and you talked about several areas where you'd like to have some specific presentations. And one of them was on athletics, if I remember correctly, to talk about the athletic programs, uh, what we're offering, how we're offering it, uh, the, about the travel expenses, and all of those pieces. And so I'm checking back with you tonight to see if you still want me to make that a part of the October 23rd presentation. And if you do, uh, if, I, if there are specific questions you want answered, so that I can talk with Keith about that so that he will be there to talk about some of those issues. Uh, that was the one major one that was presented. There are others that were also presented, but it seemed to be the athletic one seemed to be on the mind of many people as far as some discussion about that. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, for the October 23rd workshop meeting, the administrators are going to be coming with some their ideas of what they would like to look at. In addition, will they have or you have information in response to some of the questions that came up from the board in September, of which was athletics, yes. but um, on others. So, okay. So from from my perspective, I would say. Um, athletics should be discussed in, in the same conversation as um, other issues that were brought up by, by board members. I think I brought up books, mm -hmm. um, and I'm sorry, I don't blanking out on the others, but. Okay, y yes, definitely. Yeah. The, and on the 23rd, the administrators will have already given me their, blue, uh, their green sheets. And so you will have copies prior to the 23rd also, so you can have a chance to look at those and have some questions about them. So the understanding is they'll get them to me, hopefully by the end of the week, uh, on, is on computer, so that we can put them together and get them to you prior to the 23rd. But your other question about the first sheet, which I can't remember the color, I think it was, yeah. it was a color. Anyway, and I have those, those issues have been typed up and are also looked at and what, how they can report out, like you, the books, as you mentioned it as well. Yeah, you did, a, you did an amazing job of um, not only reproducing our ideas, but almost quoting us, <laughs> hey. or indeed quoting us, <laughs> on, on a various amount of issues. And I think we're in a time, we're in a tight time frame, so the sooner we can get that information and actually come up with a shared vision, um, probably the better. I was just going to add to what Rebecca was saying that I didn't really interpret what we were asking for to be any type of official presentation from people other than part of the discussion that we would. Okay. Okay. And that's what I need to understand. Trish. Trish. Um, I, in terms of the athletics, though, I think I had originally brought that up and I had a bigger picture. <laughs> um, I would hope, we've talked about this a little bit at budget, I think we talked last year. In addition to budget, I'd like to have a greater discussion both with the board and also maybe engaging the public in terms of coaching, evaluations um, from parents. How do you incorporate those? Are we doing enough to support our coaches in terms of mentoring and training for some of the younger ones? So I don't know if that's a, that's not a budget discussion. So I'm not advocating that that happens in October. It sounds like the budget issues are more pressing. But athletics is such a big part of our educational programming, we spend a lot of time on curriculum, I think I would, I would like to see us talk also about athletics in, in a 
global perspective. How, do we, how well do we do it? Not the win-loss record, but how do we do it? That's part of our kids' education. If they have a bad experience with a coach, or we're not supporting our coaches, or we're not providing them adequate training, then we're disservice, providing disservice to our students. And that was really the picture that I was looking at also, because I remember we've had that discussion several times. And uh, I think although it is not a, the major part of the budget, it is a budget process, because anything we do like that requires budgetary monies to be able to do it. And so that's why I had brought it up as having a more in-depth discussion if we need to do that. You know, and being on the extracurricular committee, we've had several discussions around different topics on the broader picture, as Trish put it, um, for athletics and looking at the program as a whole and different ways of working things. But there are definitely budget issues that we do have to discuss, such as transportation um, and coaches. Location. and. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I can see, again, I agree, I think we need to only discuss just the budget is issues of athletics coming up and look at the uh, whole program and several issues that have been brought up by both the boosters, parents, as well as board members on if, a different night. Um, perhaps a good way to do this is to have this conversation during one of our regular workshops that's not going to be taken by budget with the idea that this is a conversation for next year to take off the pressure of, well, we have to have this absolutely decided and figure it out in time for all of our numbers to be in line, but to say, okay, looking forward to next year, you know, what are the things that we can do um, to, to make improvements or changes or, or just to leave it as is if it's working well. Um, but have that in an environment that's just not pressure cooker. Mm -hmm. um, because I do think that Trish raised a good point about public input, and, I, and that takes time. Does that seem to be a fairly general agreement that we, we would do it that way? And so I'd address the actual athletic budget for 0809, address the bigger picture, looking at with public input and everything for 09010. Can't believe we're using those dates, but that's how we would go about it. For action in yep. 0910. Yep. Yes. Not 010. Um, <laughs> but so discussion later this year for implementation. Actually, I have a question. Yep. Are we under such tight constraints that we can't have that conversation so that if we feel strongly that there are things that we can improve upon, that we should be improving upon, they could take place and we would incorporate them into the 0809? I think it's all according to what you're talking about, to be very honest with you, Karen. If you're talking about very, very specific things, like is, use an example. Uh, if you're talking about uniforms, you know, that's something that's already in the budget, something we need to look at. But if we're looking at a major change, and I think one of the things Trish and I have talked about several times is the question of why do we travel so many miles to, to uh, participate in some of our sports activities? That is a much b bigger issue, and it's not one you can take care of overnight. That's one you really do need to talk with parents about. You need to talk with the main principals association. You need to talk with our leagues. You need to do all of those pieces. So I think there are, there are two pieces to that puzzle. And there is also a third piece is that you have right now a three-quarters time athletic director, an athletic director who will soon be uh, deciding to retire. And what are you going to do with that? Those are the type of issues you're going to need to d discuss fairly soon. But when it comes to the bigger issues that, will be dis that need to be discussed, I think some of those are going to take, like Rebecca was saying, more time than we can do prior to getting this uh, 0809 budget done and take care of all of the requirements of that budget. So I think if, if in that meeting on the 23rd, specific issues come up that we can take a look at that need, that need to be in the 0809 budget, we can do that. I was going to say it would be helpful, I think, if we had the long list of everything that we would like to see as part of that big picture discussion and perhaps break it down according to what's more immediate that we want to address currently for the 0809 and then what's more long term based on the need for public feedback and stuff that will then be addressed in 0910 but to have that conversation and that delineation so that we can proceed yeah. accordingly. I think that's a very good idea. 
to have, do something like that. Yeah, it could probably happen on October 23rd. Right, that's what I'm thinking. That, As things that come up, we can put it in the later exactly. pile or the sure. now pile. Sure, no, that would be fine. Be fine. Um, update on meeting with boosters. I would mention that we had, we did have a meeting with the boosters. I thought it was a very good meeting. Uh, I I would ask. I know Peter was there. I know Linda was there, and I know uh, Trish was there. And so perhaps what I would ask for any of you to speak about the meeting, uh, what you thought the prog progress was that we made, and what you thought other thing what other things needed to be done. Uh, I have certainly had a lot of positive feedback, including from several of the boosters who contacted me. So I don't know if Linda, Peter, or Trish, you have anything that you would like to mention about that meeting that evening? Well, it was a good opportunity for uh, a lot of the booster organizations to actually see what the school board has for policy. So that, um, and they were being, they, there was very much a cooperative spirit on their part. Actually, I think they were very relieved to have some kind of guidelines to go by. Um, it was nice. The presentation was very good by all of all the people that made the presentations regarding the different policies. They were very good at it, as far as spelling out um, what type of actions we were looking for on their part, and the cooperation that uh, we need from them to keep a lot of our athletic programs going. Um, at the same time, it also gave them a forum to voice some of their concerns. Um, a lot of the same concerns that we're hearing here tonight as far as the distance that uh, the children are traveling and uh, getting home and missing class time, et cetera, et cetera. Gave them an opportunity to voice those concerns and uh, make suggestions as far as alternative transportation and so forth, which again is part of the big picture that we need to discuss. I just comment that I think it was um, the start. It showed, the, highlighted the importance of communication, and that it, I hope it's the start of continued communication. And I would advocate that we um, include them in conversations about the whole athletic. We now have a group. You've done a good job in follow up, Alan, in, in connecting them. And now I think we got to maintain that contact. And, and we did set up that group that was in the policy. We set it up that night, and so I do have that group. Some need to be added still but we do have that group. I'm just very pleased with the meeting. It went very well. There were probably 24, 25, maybe even more than that there. And I think, Trish, you made a comment at the end, which I think thought was very valuable, that it offered some food for thought mm -hmm. about next steps in the process. So I was real pleased to see that happen. I would just like to add publicly a thanks to the boosters for their support of our programs and also for taking the time to participate and help us out as we go forward. Uh, recognition seven. Um, Trish, middle school facade? Yes. Um, if you've driven down Scott Dyer Road, I'm assuming you've noticed how wonderful the front of the middle school looks as compared to what it did look. And I think there are lots, it was a great community effort. There were lots of people involved parents, um, teachers, Public Works, um, Maxwell's Farm, Jordan's Farm, Nick Tamro from Tamro Landscaping. So thank you to all of them, but I did want to. Um, name the people on the landscape committee who approached me I think a year or two ago with this idea and so they really deserve the credit for taking it from an idea to reality and that would be Lisa Morris, Lindsay Alexander, Chris Pizzullo, Mary Hodgkins and Carolyn Flaherty. So thank you to all those gardeners, um, people who donated the plants, also the parents who donated plants that will be installed there. There will be a plaque that's um, going up to acknowledge the donations. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Trish. Uh, moving on to 7C, Project Blueprint. Shari? And Tom. Well, I'm inviting Tom to join me, if you don't mind. With the, um, oh, not at all. Becky and... You're standing for Becky. Yeah, you're standing for Becky and Sarah both had other meetings tonight, so they weren't able to be here. Um, I think Project Blueprint is really an extraordinary opportunity for us to work with, we have six other schools now in the United States with similar demographics. We share successes, but we also share um, problems. We share concerns. We're all in transition. We're all making changes. 
And it, I, it was really, I think, a, I'm sure, valuable for all of us to have the opportunity to learn from, from other people, um, sort of elevated conversations. And, and Cape, we can keep kind of spinning around on problems and just to have different perspectives. I thought it was very valuable. Um, I was going to tell them what's in the future. Well, just a, a brief comment from me. I had not been to the meeting. Um, this was a new cycle for me. I was talking to Alan about it. In the beginning, I think Project Blueprint participants were trying to find their way. There were a lot of common topics, but it was almost show and tell. But in the past couple of years, it's become really focused on comparing what good schools can do to become even better schools. And with the presentations Monday and Tuesday about data and the work that people can do around it, it's, it's suddenly, I mean, it's very exciting for me, and I think the other principals too, to not just look at national standards, but look at these schools, which are sprinkled around two-thirds of the country, and segment out how we're doing compared to those schools. And we have uh, not just common assessments, but common goals. So it was pretty exciting. And one day was at Pond Cove, and they were impressed with Pond Cove. <laughs> you did like the video, didn't you? Yes. Um, so and Pond Cove, after the Pond Cove presentation on DataWise, we um, started talking about what the future holds for Project Blueprint. and. Um, there's, there were so many interests that we can't just, we can't contain it in one annual meeting. So in January and February of this year, the DataWise Academy is going to continue. And um, the people in Wayland who also have connections with Harvard, as we do now, um, we're going to work together and do some more work around DataWise and what's going on with the case studies in schools that are, are using DataWise. In the spring in May at... Um, Whitefish Bay has offered to host some um, curriculum topic discussions on struggling readers, struggling um, math students, um, and also world language. Chinese was one of the languages that came up that people had an interest in. So I think what we'll do is get different people from our school, hopefully we'll be able to send them to meet and have some very specific conversations about those topics. And then next October, um, Palisades is going to do the um, hosting for the next Project Blueprint group. And we're hoping that through the work in January and February and the work in May, there'll be some topics that will rise to the surface that we can focus on. So it's wonderful. Thank you very much for all your support. It's really a great opportunity. Thank you. And if, if I could just comment briefly on this, is that uh, this is my third Project Blueprint meeting. I'm like Tom. First one I went to, I was a little concerned because I thought it was so general and just wasn't, didn't have the type of subject matter to pay the amount of money I paid to go there. Last year, we went to Wayland. It really, they really became that focus with our work with uh, Harvard and some of the things we were doing. And Shari, being the superb note taker she was, took those notes and began to take those notes and begin to look at, okay, how do we follow up what happened at Wayland and take us to a new level. And so I had more people comment to me that this was by far the best meeting they've had in a long time because it really had that focus. And I, I listened to the uh, thoughts afterwards and the next steps in planning and that focus really carried on. So I think we finally reached a place where we are doing some uh, creative things. I will tell you that uh, I haven't built in money for all of these, this traveling, so you're going to see us out trying to uh, raise money to take part in some of these things because it isn't in our budget. But I think there is such a strong feeling, and I had a lot of people, including a high school principal from one of the districts, who got so excited by the end of the second, the end of the second day that I, he was ready to take over and run the world with it. But uh, some really good, good things were coming out of this. And so it was, it to me became a content-based, thinking-based process, and not just a chance to go someplace else and socialize and talk about it. We really got down to some deep, deep thinking. And I, again, I've done this several times, but I want to thank again Shari for the leadership that she gave in order to make this thing happen and pull in all the other people who did this. Uh, it's, uh, it's always interesting when you're an introvert to have people who are not introverts doing the thinking. And sometimes I would have to walk out and let them do it and come back in again, but it really went tremendously well. And I can't thank enough the people who worked on this. It was really well done. Thank you.
Just one footnote. I, I think the uh, the work project blueprint is directly related to the consolidation that we're going through. If we want to stay high performing and reach beyond Maine, I think this is the way to do it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thanks. Thank and you. Shari and Becky and Dominic did a great job on that. So. Thank you. Superintendent's report. Alan, update on teacher leader positions. Yes. Um, as you as you know, in the last two years. We have really been doing some focusing on using people who are teachers in the system to provide <laughs> leadership in schools. Uh, we started, before I got here, you had a teacher leadership position at Pond Cove. Uh, we had to really look at that position and decide what do we really want it to be. And the issue for me was that teacher leadership is in schools, working with staff and students to improve education. So two years ago, we really looked at it. Uh, then put someone in your place who is Becky Swift, who became the teacher leader who is currently working at Pond Cove. We began to look at how is teacher leadership working and how do we want it to work. The second step came with the grant that Pond Cove got that put uh, Deb Butterworth into the position of a math teacher leader. At the same time, you remember last spring, we had many conversations about the middle school and what we would like to see happen there. We had applied for a grant, which we did not get. We continued the work with this. And due to the board and the work you did, we were able to provide the money to ensure that we could move ahead at the middle school. And at that point in time, two teacher leaders were selected, uh, one in the area of science and also doing some work in math, and the other in English language arts, and have done a tremendous job. We are very early into the steps. We're too early into the steps to really do a major presentation. But thankfully, uh, Joanne Barra and, um, yes, I just lost, lost the name. Jamie. Jamie, thank you, uh, wrote reports for us on where they are at this point. I'm not going to read them to you, but I wanted them in your packet so you could get an opportunity to read them and begin to hear some of the language and some of the things that are going on. As I mentioned with Deb, I would say the same thing about Jamie and Joanne that we will do something later on uh, once they've been gotten further into this process so they can come in and talk about it and show what changes are occurring. Uh, you, uh, Rebecca, you were at the curriculum meeting the other night and you heard some of the discussion there and some of the things that they're doing that are helping and working very hard to begin to change some of the picture. So. And if I may, I just want to um, say that uh, it's truly inspiring to sit in that meeting and in all the other meetings. Um, they're doing amazing work. Um, I can see the energy and the enthusiasm um, in, in really bringing this together. Um, and when I read this report, I just really loved, and if I can mention this, um, that uh, Michael Efron from the high school uh, taught some eighth grade classes using the constructivist approach, which is fantastic because that gets at the continuity between buildings um, and continuity within the science and math curriculums. Um, and that's what people have been talking about since this first started um, in, the, in, in enlivening the curriculum development. So it's really, it's really great. Thank you. Steve, want to say just a few Oh, Steve. The write-ups that you have right there uh, reflect Joanne and Jamie's work from last year, the 07 school year. And as you'll recall, when you're looking through that, that that was a uh, 0.2 position for each of them. So one period released each day of last year. And if you check out uh, the, my September issue of the CEMS Times, you'll see Joanne's corner and Jamie's corner in that. There's a full page right up and where, where they are at this point this year. Also, the um, newsletter that I'm working on right now should be out maybe Friday. We'll have updated pieces, and every month they'll update their progress as well. Thank you, Steve. Okay, moving on to unfinished business. Uh, consideration of policies for second reading. Trish? Yeah, we only have one. Um, it's KF, which we, this is actually our third reading on this because we had a second reading last month and we added um, at the suggestion of, I think, someone on the board, um, in a second, 
paragraph. It says rates for rentals to commercial groups, nonprofit agencies, blah, 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 shall be developed and implemented by the community services director. The comment was that we should specify who that was. So the policy committee agreed with that and made that amendment. So I would like to move that we approve the um, amended version of policy KF that you see in front of you. Thank you, Trish. Is there a second? Second. Rebecca? Comments, questions? All in favor? Six zero. Great, thank you. Alan, uh, consideration of superintendent's recommendations to co-curricular fee position for 2007-2008. We have a sheet uh, for the recommendations for co-curricular fee positions. Uh, it includes both middle school, high school, and system-wide. Uh, I will read down through them, and then uh, we can, you can uh, discuss and, and take a vote on the middle school is Sarah Kinsella, who will be the student council and share the position with Joe Doan, who was approved in June. You do realize when they share a position, we cut the price so it's half and half for the money. The high school is Hannah Jones for the literary magazine, uh, Dick Mullen for theater manager, Megan Greenlaw for freshman class advisor. Senior transition project is Dwight Ely and Ted Jordan, 50-50. Dwight's name was submitted earlier, but the contract was not, has not been issued since they have decided to share the position, so we'll be doing that one. System-wide is the certification mentors, and they are Marie Hayes, Susie Safer, Sarah Kinsella, Gary Record, Gretchen McNulty, Joyce Bell, Sonia Medina, Shala Hanna, and Angela Schipani and you can see who they're working with, each one of them on that list. Thank you, Alan. I move that we approve the superintendent's recommendations to the co-curricular fee positions for 0708. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there a second? No second. Aaron, discussion, comments? Oh, just one quick comment. Do we typically see what the fees are, or does that, is that not usually included? Uh, don't, do we usually put them on there? It's usually in the budget. Yeah. Okay. So Although we have done it in the, I've seen it sometimes in the past. I feel like sometimes I've seen it. Sometimes would you prefer to have it on these because I, we can I, do I, that? I don't think so. I would. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. We'll make sure then that the next time that is done. Okay. Any other comments? No. All in favor? Six zero. Um, moving on to the athletic fee positions for fall 2007. And this is a list from Keith Weatherby uh, for winter coaching recommendations. Uh, going down through them, the first one is Jim Ray. This is 21st year as a varsity boys basketball coach at a level four and 408 hours. The second one is Matt Reed, his second year, JV boys basketball, level three, 336 hours for the program. Chris Haywood, fourth year as freshman boys basketball level three, 196.8 hours. Doug Worthley, 12th year as varsity indoor track level three, 263.5 hours. David Weatherby is his fifth year as assistant indoor track level three, 156 hours. Ben Raymond, 13th year as varsity girls and boys swim uh, level four, 402.9 hours. David Croft, first year, assistant girls and boys swim, a level three at 255.6. Jason Tremblay, fourth year is ice hockey, level three at 380.25 hours. And Devin Morrill, assistant Nordic skiing, level three, and that's paid by the boosters. Uh, for new winter coaching recommendations, it is Chris Roberts, his first year as varsity girls basketball is a level three, 408 hours. It says Chris is a graduate and a former player at Cape Elizabeth High School. Chris was the assistant to the varsity coach at Scarborough High School last year. She will, excuse me, she will be a great asset to the girls' basketball program. Wyatt Dumas, varsity Nordic skiing, level three, 232 hours. Wyatt is a graduate of Mount Blue High School and Bowdoin College and NCSC. Uh, Wyatt has coached at Bowdoin College and Freeport Middle School. On the next page, I have John Boucher, Varsity Girls Ice Hockey Level 2. Uh, I don't know why that says zero. Volunteer? They, oh, that may be pay. it. I don't think we pay. Right. Oh, that may be it. That may be why. Yeah. John is a graduate of Biddeford High School and Southern Maine Technical College. 
John has coached at various levels, including Chevrolet, ice hockey, travel teams, as well as baseball, softball, and soccer. And the final one is Sean Garrett, our Alpine ski coach for level three. Uh, Sean is a teacher at Cape Elizabeth High School and has volunteered to coach Alpine skiing. He is looking forward to helping this program grow. Uh, those are the sports ones. And then I have a second one from Scott Labby on volunteer coaches, but you probably want to do Keith's first, yes. and then we'll do Scott Labby's. And um, I'd like to ask the board if you would allow um, a, a breaking out of those coaches. I'd like to recuse myself from the first one, but I'd like to re I'd like to vote on the others. So if somebody would make a motion on that one, and if, if we don't mind. If you I move that we approve the superintendent's recommendation to hire uh, Coach Ray as our returning basketball coach. Okay. Second. Thank you. Discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Do you want to go at it again, Rebecca? Sure. Thank you. I uh, move that we approve the superintendent's recommendation to athletic fee positions for fall 2007, um, going from Matt down to Sean Garrett. Thank you, Rebecca. Second? Second. Thank you. Discussion? I just have a quick question. Yes. Is there no JV girls basketball? Do they only have a varsity team or is... They probably just don't have the coach. Just don't have the coach yet, so if it's not on here. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? All in favor? 6-0. Thank you. Go ahead, Alan. Okay. Uh, volunteer coaches, this is from Scott Labby at the middle school. Uh, first one is Stephen Gulliver, volunteer middle school football coach. Stephen is a well-respected Cape parent. He is a Colby College graduate and did his graduate work at Northeastern University. He is a former high school football player and has coached sixth grade football for Cape. The second one is Phil Laughlin, volunteer middle school football coach. Phil is a well-respected member of the Cape community. He played football at Springfield College and professional football in Italy. He has great knowledge of football and is an excellent teacher of this uh, game. And you will note that uh, when Scott emailed Mary, he did say sorry about the late notice, but I have two volunteer coaches, uh, coaching nominations for tonight's meeting. So he did uh, mention it somewhat late. He emailed it for the last meeting, but I didn't get it in time to present it to you for the last meeting. So that's why the, the coaching has been going on all this month, but we didn't have it. So that's why the email is dated September 11th. That's right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, is there is a motion? I move that we approve the superintendent's nominations for the two volunteer football coaches at the middle school. Thank you, Trish. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Rebecca. Discussion? Questions? All in favor? 6-0. Um, consideration of Spanish exchange trip proposal. Uh, first of all, I'd like to comment on field trips. Uh, this process has become, uh, I guess I would say more than anything, quite convoluted in the process. And I've worked with Jeff in particular, with the high school ones, to try to resolve some of these applications. Uh, I have two applications here tonight that had come to me earlier. I have another application that appeared on my desk today. Uh, so. Uh, Mark is here to talk about the one to Costa Rica, and he has presented all of his information in it. Uh, and so I'm going to have Mark speak to that uh, briefly. And then I have another one from Sean Garrett. Uh, I will tell you that uh, I have, Jeff and I have had the conversation. We are looking at revising this form again to try to get as much accurate information in here as possible. Uh, so I just put that out there because uh, the policy and the process has become become a little more difficult, and so we are trying to relook at it again. But I feel Mark is well prepared. So, Mark, if you want to come up and talk about Costa Rica, thank you. Mark Pendarvis, Spanish teacher, high school. Um, I'm here tonight to present a proposal to you to allow me to take a number of students down to Costa Rica. I've done this trip before, and I've been to the town before. Um, two years ago, we went to Guapolis in Limon Province in Costa Rica to the Green Valley School down there. It's a private school, English-based. Their, their whole criteria is to teach the kids English and then curriculum as well. So 
unlike other exchange trips, I'm very well acquainted with the town. I know the parents there. Um, it's, a, it's a safe town. Um, and this way, uh, what we're doing is we're planning it through STA Travel, which is it's a nationwide company um, that books travel. So all the flights and the travel insurance is booked through STA. And the, the insurance is similar. It's almost identical to the insurance we had the last time with the in-country um, group that I worked with last time. So all that insurance is taken care of. Also, there was an issue that came up, I believe, two years ago about the school district's liability on that. And I don't have that in front of me, and I couldn't find it in my files, but I know that we looked at it, and I don't know if it was, might have been you that looked at it, and, uh, and we found that the district was covered through, through the district's policy as well, um, as far as schools go. But for travel and everything else, the kids were all covered um, down there in Costa Rica. We would travel um, from February 14th to February 28th which would mean six days for the kids being out of school. Um, and what I normally do down there is I normally allow them, when they're in class, they do about two or three hours in class, but after a while, Spanish all day long kind of blurs their eyes. So I pull them out as an English-speaking group, and they're allowed to work on their studies and catch up with homework um, together. They do work groups, a lot of them. I've had pre-calculus kids doing that kind of thing um, in that time that they're pulled out. Then we also get time to go um, with the Costa Ricans. We'll visit the Tortuguero um, National Reserve down there for a couple of days. Uh, they'll go to uh, Earth University, which is world renowned for sustainable agriculture. We've got a day planned for them there. They're going to go visit another farm as well. So the kids from here will get that experience. And then in April, um, the Costa Rican kids will come here. And I had originally put down on that report that they were coming during April vacation. But after having reconsidered that a little bit, I think, and I ta I've talked to all the parents and I've talked to my counterpart in Costa Rica, I'd rather change that to either two weeks on this side of April vacation or two weeks on the other side so that the kids are in school. It's a lot easier to maintain um, supervision of them and they, a lot easier for them to connect to. So I'm thinking on this side of April vacation, so that would be March 31st, I think, um, and then the two weeks at March 31st, and then that would run into April 1, and then then. And then we have, um, he has 13 Costa Rican kids already who are excited about coming and visiting here as well. So um, that's it in a nutshell, uh, and I'd love approval for this. And that's the other it in a nutshell. Do you have any questions, though? But I, I remember a story about some kids hiking over the turnpike one time. Was that, <laughs> yeah. was that your crew two years ago? That wasn't my group. Was that that was crew, his the, group. The they, uh, yeah, they, uh, they were here, and uh, one of the kids with limited English ability came out of Best Buy and said, how do I get to Target? And some guy pointed that way. And so, you know, in Costa Rica, they kind of do things that way. They started going across, they went across the turnpike, and they'd gotten all the way across, and the state cop pulled up, and luckily Libby Bump, I don't know if you know Libby, but Libby happened to be there and see all this, so she pulled down. She was with the exchange program, and my poor Costa Rican counterpart, he said, this is truly a, an immigration experience. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but that won't happen. This time we'll inform them. And Jose, Jose Luis is very aware of the, uh, the turnpike okay. in the middle of January. Yeah, well, these are, these, those are some things that come up, but nothing that lively. I, I know one question that I'm frequently asked, and I'm just checking with you for chaperones. Now, obviously, you'll be one of the chaperones, and you have another person. Do you have a female chaperone going with you or another male? No, I don't have any female chaperones going with me. But uh, when, once we're in Costa Rica, um, the, it's, they're very heavily chaperoned. The, the Costa Ricans take their children very seriously as far as chaperoning and making sure everybody's safe. And um, it's always been, you know, all the kids have been really well watched all the way through. Um, but, you know, from the airport there, it's, it's a pretty public place as well, you know, going from... We'll be going from here to Boston, Boston 
direct to San Jose. And then San Jose on a bus over um, to uh, Guapiles. And that's, mm -hmm. and then they're, then they're in their families, then they're in their homes, or else they're with us. And when we did travel in Costa Rica, we had at least uh, two or three parents, females, that came with us as well. And they supervised the kids there. So those were Costa Rican parents? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Okay. Because the, the question I ask is that at this point you only have girls signed up. And so I just wanted to be sure you had some supervision, female supervision, so that when they're in places you can't go into, that there's somebody there to be sure to know what they're doing. And I know that's a question I get from the board, and so I just wanted to be sure that that had been considered. Yeah, every trip that we took, there was always somebody there that was a female that went with us. We did a rafting trip last time. We did a canopy trip. Um, and we went to Tortuguero, and it was all, we had those things situated. Other questions? Does anybody want to make a motion? I move that we approve the um, Costa Rican exchange trip as presented. Thank you, Trish. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Rebecca. Discussion? All in favor? Six nothing. Eight. Thank you very much. And I promise we'll do a presentation when we get back. All right, great. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Okay, um, <laughs> let's see. Consideration uh, request from Palm Cove Teach for a leave of absence. Would, prior to that, there was another one in your packet when it came to you, I believe, from Sean, Sean, Sean Charette. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. And it isn't on the agenda. I didn't notice that until you just started to read it. Okay. But we did get one from Sean Garrett. Uh, I have, it's a single page request. Uh, this is for the um, science team and the work that they do, uh, and they go to destinations of Danvers, Chelsea, Lawrence, Woburn, Marblehead, and Bellricker. Uh, they're approximately 100 miles each. Normally, this is something I approve alone because uh, there's not an overnight, if I'm not mistaken. But I'd like you to see these. Uh, am I right, Jeff, that there's no overnight here? But I'd like you to see these, to know what is coming in these, and if you remember correctly, last year, Sean's group came in first place mm -hmm. in the Northeast yes. uh, in the work they have done. Mm -hmm. So I bring this to you just so you'll see it and understand that this has been requested. Uh, there is a piece on here. Uh, uh, every piece that's on here that fits into this category has been taken care of, but so, just so you understand that. I'm sorry, okay. now we can no, go to the that's okay. Um, and now we move on to consideration of requests from Ponco so Teacher. For, for a leave of absence? Mm -hmm. Not yet. No, I'll get, to, I'll, I'll get that. This one is from Fran Vita Taylor, who does teach at Pond Cove. She sent you a fairly long letter, which I'm not going to read completely through, but basically is saying that she is requesting uh, unpaid leave of absence for the school year 2008-2009. This leave has several issues within it, including health uh, concerns about her uh, family. Also, some other, other issues that she wants to be able to take care of at that time. Uh, and so she is looking at that as an opportunity to take care of some of the things that need to be done within her family situation. Uh, and so I am recommending that you do accept this for 08 and 09. So it is for next year. Thank you, Alan. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you, Linda. Second? Trish? Any discussion? Questions for Alan? No? All in favor? Six zero. Okay. Um, resignation, Alan. Okay, I have a resignation. I just was looking at the date of it. I thought it came in today, but it's dated September 20th. It was on my desk this morning. But it is from. I think it was sent to uh, the school office. I have to start the next oh, okay. Day. Okay. So this is from Susan Long who is hereby resigning her position as a health aide at Pond Cove Elementary School, effective October 19th, 2007. Um, and that's all the information I have about that. I have asked Mary to call her as I am trying to get back to after last year with all of the interruptions in my year to have exit interviews, so I will be having an exit interview with her. 
Do we have to accept that? Or is no, that it's just an informational piece informational? for you. Okay. Yep. Yep. And I do it mainly because I also noticed today the first application for the position came in, even though we haven't advertised it. So, uh, it, so I just wanted you to know that the, we're going to be going through that process. Okay, and then a field trip, uh, Gretchen McNulty. Okay, and this is one that just came today also. It was on my desk this morning. Uh, I've talked with uh, uh, Jeff about it because I wanted some things uh, carefully taken care of, and I did ask Jeff if he could talk about this one and the plan that's, that uh, is in this. So, if Jeff, if you don't mind. Looking at mine, it look, I think there's some pages missing, but if you can, are there three pages after that? Two. Two, I think. That's all we got. No, just one. Two. Two I thought originally two. there were three, but anyway, perhaps you can talk about it for me, but I thought the original had three in it. I think there were three, three different components of it. Okay, this is um, last year, as you know, the. Um, World Affairs Council Model UN program got started, and it's been a really um, highly successful program, and it's, uh, a lot of students have been involved in it. Um, the nature of the program is such that um, the, the sort of the best opportunities for kids to be able to participate in this um, are unfortunately not within easy driving distance all the time. So Gretchen has been looking for some opportunities. Um, my understanding is she has listed these with the understanding that she's not going to be, she's not intending that she's going to be going to all of these. They've just been starting to meet with the kids. Um, and the, these conferences are just beginning to get lined up. So she's, she apologizes for getting it sort of late. Uh, but a month from now would be pretty close to the first trip if she chooses to do that. Um, I did ask her to the first page is really what she initially presented to me, and then I asked her to put it on the um, authorization form that has been adopted to implement the school board's new policy about field trips. We talked specifically about um, whether or not there would be staff members or chaperones of different genders um, on the trip, and indeed there will be. Um, and the, she's told me that there won't be any more, I believe, than 12 to 15 kids on any of these trips. So the, the, the sort of the ratio of kids to teachers, kids to chaperones is well taken care of. Um, the other chaperone besides Gretchen is actually her husband, who formerly was a coach um, in the Cape Elizabeth school system. So he's gone through fingerprinting and um, will go through the volunteer, that, um, that sort of stuff as well. And I think she's lined up the... Um, the transportation as well. So that's basically what this is. It's an opportunity, but because it does involve out-of-state trip involving overnight requests, it does fall within the new field trip policy requiring school board approval. Questions? Jeff. Okay. Go ahead. Um, I guess I asked the same question. There's no signature from Alan or Jeff. Are you approving these and recommending them? Yeah, there, sh there should be, because Gr Chris, she put it together at the last minute, I said email it to, yes, bottom line, yes. <laughs> and tell about you. <laughs> yes. I just want to be sure everything is in place that we need to have. That was my only question. See, my question or comment is that I think I'd feel more comfortable approving it if I knew specifically what they were doing. I mean, I guess you have the options, but it just seems a little odd in its... What, I'm sorry, what is the question? Presentation. Just seems a little odd in its presentation, so she's not quite sure, like, when will, you, when will it be figured out what it is they're going to be doing? What, she just, I mean, she's only, she's had a couple meetings with the kids at this point, and she has to sit down and talk, talk with them, and she has to look specifically at some airfares and what they're going to be doing, because she hasn't booked any of these things, obviously, as well. So she's going to take a look at it within the next few weeks, make some final determinations about these, this is where we will definitely be going would like to be able to be, be going. But she wanted to cover her bases as well because the first of the trips comes up within a reasonable, not immediately, but it's, it's reasonably quickly after in its next month, so the end of next month. I think to Karen's point, um, I think on page two she's asking for the New Jersey, Princeton, New Jersey trip. I think maybe it would make sense to have that trip happen and then have her come back and based on how that goes ask for approval specifically for each of these rather than a blanket approval on all of them? Correct. Oh, 
I would support that. I would too. She, she could do that. I think that would be fine. I do think when we look back at the originals, I think all three of them were in there. I apparently didn't get all copied, but that's the first one, so you could do it that way. Yeah, I think she. I thought. I thought she did. Yeah, I think there were all. I think there were three in the packet that I saw this morning. So uh, apparently the other two didn't get copied. But I think Trisha's suggestion can work. Yeah. Um, okay. Do you want to make a motion, Trish? I move that we approve the um, Model UN trip to Princeton. On November 29th to December 2nd. Thank you. Is there a second? A second. Aaron, discussion? <laughs> Rebecca. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused because it says um, we will not go to all of them, but prepare only for those three or four which work best. But I see a listing of only three. Three. Right. So. How many more are there? As I said, I think this morning in the packet that I saw on my desk, there were the oh, yeah. cover letter and three different uh, proposals in it. Yeah, I know. okay, but are there more than just these three that they were choosing from? What, and it is, <laughs> I think it's not a bad idea what, what Trisha's saying because I know Gretchen would be glad to come and talk to you about the program okay. specifically. She wasn't able to be here tonight. Um, my understanding from my conversation with Gretchen is there are three listed here, but, but and there are some others that she's been thinking about, but they're farther in, in, the, in the future. But really, she's probably only going to be going to two of these conferences during the course of the year. I believe that's the way it is, but you may have some more. Well, no, I'm just looking at the dates, and there are other issues, in two, in terms of her being out of her classroom, because the first one is November 29th to December 2nd, and the next one is December 6th to December 9th. So she would be gone from school almost an entire week if she went to both of them. I don't, I'm, I'm quite sure she's not planning on going to both of those first two conferences. Okay, but you said there were three forms for each of these trips on there? I think there were three forms in there. My, the original is upstairs, and so I'd have to go back and check it. But I think when that was placed on my desk, there were three forms attached to it. What I would suggest is what you suggested in the beginning. The only one that I think is a date where we need to move fairly quickly because you have to make arrangements ahead of time is approve the first one. Uh, we'll bring her back to talk about the others, and if she doesn't go on that, then that's that's where it'll be, and I'll get that information. But that's fine because because the second one, Harvard. I mean, that, that those are transportation arrangements are obviously closer, and they don't require booking in in advance as much. You want, uh, well, on that note too, since they're so close in time, and she does indicate that she's a chaperone for both of them, should there be some assessment to distance? I mean. Or who's going? I mean, is it going to be different kids that go to Princeton and then she's going to take a different group to Harvard? Does it make sense to maybe not go to Princeton in light of the cost and then four days later just go down to Boston? My, my guess is, is that she's, she's put in three requests, not knowing which of the three Correct. she's going to. Oh. Then it's I go back to Karen's yeah. point. I'm not ready to approve any of them right. until, until I know, know where she's going and right. does it make sense? I mean, does it make sense? These are great trips. They're good experiences. However, does it make sense to go down to Princeton through December 2nd when you have an opportunity to go to Harvard, which is Boston, and the kids are going to get the same experience four days later? But that, that, in talking to Gretchen, that's part of the issue. That I mean, the, this program is a fairly new program sort of nationwide, um, and different colleges are beginning to develop um, um, competitions or events around these programs. but they are actually quite different. And that's part of the reason why um, Gretchen, I think, is trying to leave things a little bit up in the air, because she's trying to find out some more details to get a sense of where the kid's going to have the best quality experience. Um, in, yeah. Um, and so in fact, Princeton and Harvard may be quite different experiences in terms of the other schools who are participating and that sort of thing. So that's what she's trying to, um, to, to ascertain at her end about where is the best experience for the kids. Thank you. Yep. So just to confirm, she is trying to figure out which of these three would be best for experiences. So we're not talking about back-to-back -back trips. We're talking no. about her say, saying all three of these are possible destinations, and because it's so close, I need them approved so that we can move ahead. I don't have a problem. That's exactly so then right. it doesn't make any sense for us to approve the Princeton trip by itself. Right. We should approve all three. Or none at all. Or none at all. 
So we have a motion on the table to approve the Princeton trip. Uh, Trish made the motion. I withdraw it. Thank you. What if y'all were to move to uh, approve it under the contingency that it, she didn't go on all three at once? Are we not clear, though, that all three are going to happen? I, I know that all three are not going to happen. All three are not. I, th that's a certainty. Okay. I, I have. I, I move that we um, approve the World Affairs Council trips as proposed with the understanding that um, the organizers will be choosing one of these trips to attend. That's not very good English. I apologize. <laughs> And is that her? Is that what she wants to do? I thought that she told me she was looking at the possibility of two trips. Um, yeah. But definitely not Princeton Harvard. Um, another possibility is to, to 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 approve them as far in terms of investigating them and that sort of stuff, and then informing Alan and through Alan the board about what her final decisions are. Um, subject to the final board approval, if that works. And that's kind of the where only, I was. The only one here, the only one that requires significant advance planning and booking through airplanes, which is the most um, thing you have to do far enough in advance, is Princeton. The rest of them are going to be ground transportation that could be handled, not last minute, but um, they don't require weeks and weeks ahead of time booking. Okay, Rebecca's made a motion. I would draw. Okay. <laughs> I wonder if we should go back to the original motion that Trish withdrew and just approve the first one and then have her come back with clarity in the what it is exactly. Does somebody want to make another motion? But that yeah. may not be the no. trip she's going to take. Right. So I, that was I in error. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, yeah. You've got one? No. Does somebody want to make a motion? Oh, can I just can I <laughs> can I follow up? Jeff was saying I honestly I, I, the first time I saw this was today, so I have no background information whatsoever, and it's one of those issues where I hate getting things at the last minute and having to bring them to the board. What I'm going to suggest you do is this: I need I need some direction from you in saying that it, it, I can look at what she's doing. I can approve a trip in the beginning, and if the trip that looks the most difficult is Princeton because of the flight. If she's not going to do that, the rest of them she could come back and report to you on anyway. So if you can give me the leeway to look at the Princeton one and either approve or disapprove that, and the understanding that she will come to the next meeting, whether it be on October 23rd or it will be in the first meeting in November, uh, so that she can come in and speak to these as well, I think that would be the most helpful. And I would, I would be happy if you want to give me and say to me, I will get the information from her, and I can decide whether she can go or not, for instance, if that's the one she wants to go on. Would somebody like to make a motion to that effect? So moved. Thank you, Trish. <laughs> Is there a second? <laughs> second. Karen? Yes, that was a second. Sorry. No, that's okay. I was looking one way. I zigged. Um, any further discussion? All in favor? Okay. Thank you. Um, committee reports. Standing committees. Oops. Um, if the committee chairs could give a brief um, <laughs> overview of what their committees are doing. Um, we'll start with Rebecca with finance. Mine's really brief. Uh, we met September 26th and it was myself as a committee member and um, Linda did come by and sign warrants ahead of time. And there was not a lot to discuss because we were at the beginning of the um, school year, so there was no energy report, no food service report to review. They will be available in October. We did discuss briefly the fact that um, there is a deadline of July 1st for booster financial reports. Um, and as of September 26th, Alan had reported that he had not received any. Um, so. I would ask maybe the extracurricular committee could help expedite this. No. As of October 9th, the report is ready for the finance committee on the 19th. Okay. Excellent. Then, and that next finance committee meeting will be um, October 18th, 8 o'clock in the superintendent's office. Now, it says here Friday, October 19th. Is it the 19th or the 18th? 
Let's go through this. 19. Okay. Thank you, Tr uh, Rebecca. Yeah, I saw you, Trish. Huh? Policy, Trish. Um, the policy committee met on September 21st, and we're in the middle of lots of things. That's why you didn't have a lot of policies to look at tonight. Um, we're in the middle of student placement, policy JG, that's coordinating um, policies among all the schools. We're in the middle of policy JEA, attendance and truancy. Um, there's some, been some new guidelines and legislation coming out on that, so we're looking at that and comparing ourselves to some of the other communities. IKD, which was the honor roll and the 10-point system, which thank you to Kirsten and Hudson for providing some feedback on that. Um, JIC, which is student conduct. There's new language on bullying that needs to be included, included, so we're working on that. We're revisiting IKI and IKAB, which is student assessments. We had put these on hold while the state decided the status of the local assessment system, so we're working on that. Um, and that's it. We're meeting again on next Tuesday, the 16th. Thank you, Trish. Communication, Trish, again? <laughs> we have not met yet. We are meeting on Thursday, this Thursday. October 11th, 3? Yep. Okay, thank you. Personnel, Linda? Uh, the personnel committee met, and I apologize. I uh, don't have the date here in front of me. Uh, last month, and the basis of our discussion was it's that time of year for the superintendent's evaluation. Um, I am in the process of actually taking the form that we used last year. We went through line by line and were able to condense a lot of the questions. And um, so we can get that out to the board members for them to complete. And it will be in a different, slightly different format this year to allow for more room for comments and also provide a rating scale for everybody. Um, along with that, um, we are going to be putting out an announcement to all of the staff members to have them add any feedback they might have as far as Ellen's evaluation is concerned. And also we're looking at using an evaluation form for the board so that we can do a self-evaluation of the board itself. Our next meeting is scheduled for this Thursday at 8 a.m. in the Jordan Conference Room. Thank you, Linda. Linda, can I ask you a question? Sure. Will there be an opportunity for the whole board to see ahead of time the um, superintendent evaluation yeah. form and also the self-evaluation form just for um, comment or yeah. application? Actually, we don't have a self-evaluation form yet. That's when there is one? Right. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thanks. Any other questions? No? Strategic planning, Trish? Yes, we met um, on September 18th. We started discussing each of the goals that we had identified in the, in the goal statement that the board adopted last June. Um, we identified the action teams that should be associated with those. Some of the committees already exist and some don't. We discussed sort of what the membership and those committees should be, and Alan will be identifying the membership with the input of the DLT. We reviewed the calendar. Um, with a targeted date for the strategic plan implementation with a targeted date of the beginning of March for the action teams to report back to the DLT and Alan and our committee. And that was it. Our next meeting is Monday, October 22nd. Thanks, Trish. Extracurricular, Linda? Uh, extracurricular met just last week, October 2nd, in the Jordan Conference Room. Um, first, we review these minor revisions that um, Sue had for KF-R, Community Use of Facilities Guidelines. There was a small revision she made on the back of the first page concerning Hannaford Field. Um, the majority of our discussions were around policy DFDR, which is the gate receipts and emissions. And we looked at a lot of the public feedback that we've received on this particular policy having to do with gate receipts and so forth did make a few minor revisions as far as the age of senior citizens at 62 or older will be admitted free to all events. Wanted to make sure that that was clear. And there were a couple other minor revisions made, um, such as admission would only be charged at high school night game sporting events um, on Hanford Field. Um, so therefore, we don't have to be concerned with any middle school sports or anything like that. The discussion, we also had discussions regarding having hiring an individual to collect gate fees 
rather than having the boosters do them. Now, naturally, that would come out of the proceeds of the gate fees as an expense. Um, I also provided the members some sheets that Keith had provided to us at our meetings to kind of give us an idea of where we were at uh, in comparison to other schools in this area as far as what we would be charging for different sports. We are going to make a separation between um, football and hockey. We'll have admission fees. You know, it's recommended by the committee that the admission fees for football and hockey be $4 for adults, $2 for kids, with a maximum of a $10 charge for families. All other sports, it will be $3 for adults and $1 for students. Um, and that was the basis of our, all of our discussions. Um, the policy will be going, has, or is moving on to the policy committee for their recommendation. As far as the fees themselves, we are leaving that to the discretion of the superintendent and the athletic director to set the fees on an annual basis, but wanted to provide you with some information from our, the, our other area schools as far as what they're collecting. Thank you, Linda. Yep. Um, on this committee, Rebecca. I had a dog emergency, <laughs> speaking of wellness, so I was unable to attend, but Karen was there, so I'm gonna ask her to give the report. Thank you. We met on October 1st, and in addition to our work with Let's Go as presented here tonight, there were um, many other exciting things that have been taking place. Uh, Paula Harris helped coordinate the PAC program at Pond Cove um, in September, which encouraged students and parents to pack a variety of vegetables and fruits in the students' lunches over the course of several days based on color. Um, several members of the PC staff helped promote these activities, and the Food Services Director Sue King also supported the program in the cafeteria. Harvest Day took place in September and was coordinated by Sue Weatherby. Um, Pond Cove students had the opportunity to eat local corn from Jordan's, for Jordan, excuse me, farm. Sue will also be organizing the, white, um, the walk by to school day this month, so stay tuned. Uh, Sue King of Food Services has been gathering feedback from students as changes begin to take place in food offerings, for example, a reduction in foods heavy in sugar and fat. Um, ben Berman, the student rep on the Wellness Committee, pointed out student disappointment in the disappearance of big cookies. I think we referred to them tonight as the cow chip. What, what, what was that? <laughs> So um, that actually has not gone over too well, so there was some discussion about that, and Sue's been very good about collecting feedback from the students. Ben also presented the idea of increasing the awareness of the impact of driving under the influence, and we'll be discussing this further with Alan and the Wellness Committee. Um, finally, we'll be working on compiling a calendar of dates that relate to the Wellness Initiative in Cape to increase awareness of the work being done. And our next meeting is Monday, November 5th, um, at 3.15 in the fire station conference room. Thank you very much, Karen. Linda, you don't need to repeat your no, presentation. I didn't think so. <laughs> Thank you. Um, appointments, paths. I um, went and had lunch with Kevin on his last day at paths, and um, they were very nice. They did a little presentation, said what a great job he had done, and um, I think that was about the extent of it for now. Um, don't know what's coming up in the future, but I guess we'll find out. <laughs> so, um, that's my report. Uh, Rebecca, legislative liaison, anything? Yeah, now speaking of not knowing what's coming up, I'm, I always get nervous this time of year because the legislature will be meeting again soon. Um, but obviously, as we mentioned earlier, they are going to be looking at exemption standards and perhaps revising those. So that will be of great interest to Cape Elizabeth. Um, and I'll keep you posted. And will um, Cynthia be keeping you posted on any yeah, yeah. potentials? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, advisory, Karen Seif. Um, I forwarded the meeting minutes from the last Seif meeting to everyone today, um, specifically pertaining to the grants. And we'll just briefly mention some highlights. Um, Deb Butterworth, as Alan mentioned earlier this evening, explained her work in the newly created position of math lead teacher at Pond Cove which was made possible through a CIF large impact grant. And her presentation and work done to date was very well received by the CIF board and will be instrumental in helping the Pond Cove teachers assess the math needs of the K-2 um, second graders. And also all spring grants to date have been funded by CIF with the exception of some teacher stipends. And October 15th is the deadline. Um, I'll just reiterate that I mentioned that last meeting for fall grants and the budget is roughly 25,000 that they'll be dispensing. 
Um, and I'll also be meeting with Dory Barber, the president of CEIF, to, to continue a discussion we began last spring regarding improving the relationship between CEIF and the school board while acting as a school board liaison. And I'll report back at our next business meeting what ensues from that discussion. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, Peter, Hannaford Field Committee. Much of what the Hannaford Field Committee discussed at its last meeting has already carried over into extracurricular. Linda, in sharing that meeting with Keith Weatherby's help, has already reacted to a lot of their concerns and requests, and final decisions have been made. We also gained a lot more information at the boosters meeting, and Keith and Alan covered that on behalf of the committee because they sit on it also. There are still concerns about gate receipts, seating, stadium seating, police protection. Uh, Keith has already worked with the police in lowering the number of police that are there for some games. And that will be ongoing, as I said at our last school committee meeting, we're learning all the time. As you can see by some of the things that Linda presented to us tonight, one of our biggest costs is now portable toilets. And we're trying to gauge how many of those we need for what games. And we'll know a lot more next year. I mean, but you can see we've made money on football and lost money on field hockey and soccer as far as gate receipts and covering some of our unexpected expenses of operating the field and wandering about town. There is still some concern about seating. Uh, we do have an aging population. I'm one of them. Uh, we're going to have to address that when the budget allows, and that may be far into the future. But ongoing, I've been watching the actual operation of the field at some of the night games. I'm pleased with it, and uh, I think we can continue to improve and just constantly learn and use our common sense. And by the end of the next two night games, I'm sure we'll have it taken care of. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, Public comment? Seeing none. Um, school board agenda requests. Does anybody have any requests for next month? No? Um, I guess I'll uh, forego the announcement of upcoming meetings as we've done that as part of our um, committee reports. Can I add one? Um, yes. The Sports and Right leadership team is going to be meeting on October 16th at 7 o'clock at Community Services. That will be our first meeting. All right, would you repeat that just one more oh, time? Oh, sure. October 16th yes. at 7 o'clock at Community Services. Great. Thank you, Karen. Any other additions? Hey, I also have a question. Um, could we make sure that the curriculum committee meeting always appears on the dates to remember? And is that curriculum committee meeting, it's always the fourth Wednesday of the month? Is that correct? I don't have my calendar with me, so I'll okay. have to check it and email you about it. Is on my calendar. And the curriculum committee is made up of a school board member in addition or two, two school board members. Thanks again, Karen. Anything else? Is there a motion to adjourn? So, so moved. moved. <laughs> is there a second? All in favor? Peter, did you want to say? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.